Okay. Ladies and gentlemen, colleagues, good afternoon. My name is Kay Dunkley and I will be your chair. I'll be guiding you th through today's session. Before we begin, I'd like to say a special hello to all persons who are here, but a particular hello to these members who have traveled near, far, and done everything to make this day possible. To our president, Acting Rudolph Sewell, to our vice president administration in the room, Mr. Alvin Lawson, to our vice president academics entering the room, Dr. Benjamin, to our foundation members, board members, others, good afternoon. To our, to the president, Trevor Thomas, of the Michael University Foundation of the Americas, CEO, and one of the largest contributors. Thank you for being here, sir. To our deans, directors, academic staff, principals, near and far, our own Reverend Boswell Mullings, chaplain, good afternoon again. I stand here proud to rep to stand in the legacy of the Honorable Glenville Owen. Because in 1991, when this came about, it was something of a vision. It was something of a conversation. It was something to lead the way. Because again, it's not something that we do often. We don't look at the challenges. We don't explore the underside. Sometimes we like to focus on the good stuff. But in his vision, he saw where it was necessary that we not only focus on education, but we look at the things that will stand in its way for efficiency and effectiveness. But I'm not going to lead the way. But again, I welcome you. As is customary, I will call upon our chaplain, Reverend Bosworth Mullings, to begin the day with prayer. May I ask you to stand in acknowledgement of our supreme and sovereign Lord, who is always present. Let us pray. Gracious God, our Heavenly Father, you who raised up the people who founded the Michael, you who have continued to support and supply the people of excellence to lead it, people of excellence, to be students and to be trained. Thank you for the legacy of the Honorable Glenville Owen. Thank you that even as we celebrate all that he has done, we are still being inspired by his vision. And as we look at the issues and challenges facing educational institutions in Jamaica, and to present the way forward in these troubled times. We are mindful that you have supplied, yes, Lord, you have supplied the values, the gifts, the graces, the intellect of persons in this institution to be challenged, to be nurtured, to be stimulated. And so, Lord God, be with our main presenter today, Dr. Stephen Carr. Inspire him as you have been doing throughout his life. And may we receive the messages and deliberate on it so that your name will be honored and this institution will continue, will continue to listen to the voices that will aid our progress. 
In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you very much, Reverend Boswell Mullings, our chaplain. And it is, we thank those who have gone before us because we actually stand on their shoulders. Consciously or unconsciously, all the Myconians who have led the way have created the space for us today. It is not very often that we pay attention, but during the Michael week, we pay special attention to the legacy. We pay special attention to, to what has been. Because if we forget where we're coming from, we are bound to repeat our history slash mistakes. When the Glenn Owen lectures began, and I, start, I have the start date of 1991, the Honorable Professor Rex Nettleford led the charge. And he led the charge and he opened the way for the conversations that proceeded over the years. Between 1992 and 1999, we had Mr. Rennis Johnson, who led the conversation, who had the discussions. And I'd like us here all to recognize him because this year we actually lost his physical presence. I ask for a moment of silence as we remember one of the forerunners, one of the persons who made today possible. Thank you for that. We continue with our program and we ask Mr. Rudolph Sewell, President, acting, to come forward. Moderator Dr. K. Dunkley, Dr. Stephen Carr, guest presenter, Ms. Delia Owen, niece of the late Honorable Glenville Owen, members of the boards of the Michael University College and the Michael Foundation, Dr. Glenda Prescott, president of the Michael University College Alumni Association, MOSA, executive members of MOSA locally and abroad, the chief Executive Officer of the Michael University College Foundations of the America, Administrators and Staff of the Michael University College, Members of the Council of the Guild of Students at the Michael, all alumni of the Michael, all current students, especially residents of the Glen Owen Hall, visitors to the campus, ladies and gentlemen, Good afternoon. Michael graduates have been known as facilitators of the education and general empowerment of people here in Jamaica and across the world. What is not often articulated is that the Michael has traditionally been a center for thought and an influencer of the national policy agenda. In advancing this role, as a center for thought and an influencer of the national policy agenda in recent times, the MICO has hosted a number of research conferences as well as the innovative MICO conversation series, which examined issues ranging from desired educational outcomes for an emerging economy to strategies for job creation. 
I wish to remind us of the 2019 International Mathematics Summit, which brought together experts from across the world and created a launch for the introduction of the Program for International Assessment, PISA, in Jamaica. I wish to remind us that in 2023, the MICO partnered with Century 21 Education and the Ministry of Education and Youth to execute a game-changing conference focused on sustainable STEM education. I must point out, ladies and gentlemen, that when I speak of the MICO, I am referring not only to the current staff and students of the University College. The MICO is a huge family, consisting of the trustees of the Lady Michael Charity, the Michael Foundation, the Michael University College Foundation of the Americas, other foundations started by alumni such as the Ellen E. Rodney Foundation, Myconians such as the late Rennis Johnson and his wife Mervis, who have been very generous in student support for over 40 years, Al alumni across Jamaica and the entire world, and of course, the ever-present Michael University College Alumni Association, MOSA. This afternoon, I salute MOSA for its tenacity and commitment to the staging of the annual Glen Owen Memorial Lecture honoring the stalwart Myconian. MOSA, members and supporters, your dedication to your alma mater is commendable, and the institution continues to benefit from your tangible and intangible support. Today's theme, issues and challenges facing educational institutions, the way forward in these troubled times is quite timely. And given my current role in the institution, I'm somewhat anxious to hear the thoughts. Like you, I'm looking forward to the presentation by our esteemed speaker, Dr. Stephen Carr, who is highly respected for his research and thought leadership on educational matters. Ladies and gentlemen, I join the leadership of MOSA in extending to you very cordial welcome. We are in for a treat. I say that because the gentleman who will be our main presenter is someone that I have known and I have listened to. And I like how he thinks and I like how he faces challenges and he puts it in a way that we can understand it and we can learn from it. So I'm looking forward to hearing what he has to say. Before we go any further, though, I bring to the stage the president of the Michael University College Alumni Association. With many, many years and many, 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 many members all over the world, this is an organization that almost that members of the University College are proud, I would say, uh, followers. They have built the legacy that we're walking into. And so I call Dr. Glenda Prescott, president, to give us her welcome. Good afternoon, everyone. Dr. Stephen Carr, our presenter, our guest presenter this evening. Mr. Woodall Sowell, acting president, the Michael University College, members of Alumni Association, executive, all executive members of MOSA, the CEO of MUFCA, Mr. Thomas, administrators and staff of the Michael University College, members of the Council of the Guild of Students, at the Michael, all current students, especially residents again of the Glen Owen Hall, visitors on campus, ladies and gentlemen, members of the board of directors of the Michael and the Michael Foundation, good afternoon. 
On behalf of the executive members of the Michael University College Alumni Association, MOSA, it is my distinct pleasure to extend warm greetings to each and every one of you. As we gather here today, we embark on a journey that began 35 years ago when the inaugural lecture series took root. These enlightening sessions were conceived by one of, the, of MOSA's esteemed past president, Mr. Birchall Duhaney. I would like Mr. Duhaney to stand to be recognized. The very first lecture was delivered by the late professor Rex Nettleford, a luminary whose wisdom continues to resonate. Subsequently, we were enriched by the insight of Mr. Rennis Johnson, an outstanding Myconian who graced our midst until just a month ago. It is with this heartfelt gratitude that we acknowledge his wife, Mrs. Mervis Johnson, also a proud Myconian, for generous, generously sponsoring this evening's refreshment. <laughs> the Johnson's legacy extends beyond mere words. Their contributions have fueled significant projects at our beloved alma mater, including the annual scholarships. These distinguished lecturers align with the core mission of our organization, preserving the tradition of the Maiko University College as a beacon of educational excellence. Today's lecture, much like its predecessors, promises to ignite thought-provoking discourse and leave an indelible mark. Now, let us turn our attention to a pivotal figure in the annals of this institution. Honorable Glenn Owen. His name graces a hall and rightly so. Firstly, Mr. Owen holds the distinction of being the first graduate to ascend to the position of principal within these hollowed walls. Secondly, he assumed leadership during a critical juncture a time when expansion and development were imperative. Under his stewardship, the college witnessed the inaugural phase of physical growth with the construction of all the halls. Simultaneously, the student body burgeoned and the teaching staff expanded when Mr. Owen assumed office. The student count over at around a modest 100. By the time he stepped down, it had swelled to over a thousand students. Let us honor Mr. Owen's legacy as we delve into today's enlightening discourse. Thank you for being a part of this enduring tradition. And I welcome, again, I welcome you all here this evening. And as, as I turn this evening's proceedings back over to our chair. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I see an um, distinguished principal has arrived, but we know her as a, a member of the alumni. Thank you very much for being here. Miss, uh, yes. Our own Dorrit Campbell, we will, all right. The power of education extends beyond the development of skills. We need it for economic success. It can contribute to nation building and reconciliation when handled properly. I now call to the stage, I now call to the stage, Mr. Alvin Lawson, VP Acting. 
to provide an overview of the Glenn Owen Lecture. Ladies and gentlemen, esteemed guests, it is with great honor that I stand before you to provide an overview of the annual Glenn Owen Lecture, dedicated to commemorate the legacy of Glenville Hamilton Owen, past principal of the Michael University College. Glenville Hamilton Owen, an eminent scholar and exemplary citizen, assumed the principalship of the Michael College in 1959. His vision was to foster academic and professional excellence in teaching, grounded in the belief that individuals of intelligence, spirit, and leadership must engage in teacher education to enhance the quality of education across the system. Under his stewardship, the college expanded physically and academically, introducing new programs and enhancing staff quality. Beyond the college walls, Mr. Owen was deeply involved in community-based organizations, providing leadership and organization, notably as president of the Jamaica Teachers Association, where he spearheaded the first Jamaica National Conference in Education. His contribution to education and public life remains a testament to, the, to his enduring legacy, revered by Jamaica and cherished by his alma mater. In tribute to Glenville Owen, life, in tribute to Glenville Owen's life and achievement, the Mosa executive initiated the Glen Owen Lecture in 1984. These lectures, featuring distinguished speakers, delved into critical issues related to education and national development, echoing Mr. Owen's emphasis on community development, academic excellence, and professional teacher training. This evening, we gather yet for another Glen Owen lecture. We continue the tradition of meaningful engagement and exploration of solution inspired by Glen Owen's vision and values. I'm confident that this evening's presentation will offer insightful perspectives and practical application enriching our collective understanding and commitment to excellence. Thank you for joining us as we honor the enduring legacy of Glenville Hamilton Owen and celebrate his invaluable contribution to our alma mater and beyond. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you. Good evening. We have a hall, the Glen Owen Hall, and we will call upon Mr. Shaw to provide a report on what's going on in the hall.
Good uh, afternoon, everyone. I apologize for the lack of display. It is my fault. <laughs> so um, I'm here to present a bit on the Glen Owen Hall and our, life, our lives down there as men of might. So <clears throat> we know that the Glen Owen Hall houses the men from the Lushington and the Rogers House. Can we hear a roar for that? For the Lushington men and the Rogers men. <laughs> Sir Lawson. <laughs> um, yes, so we down at the Glen Owen Hall, we do a lot of activities such as playing games. We know we play our little dominoes, our little card games to keep us entertained at night. We also... On Sundays, though reluctant, we do our hall duties in the morning where we come out, we clean up, we try to get it, get the hall up to standard for the week ahead. We also try to do a little homework program where we assist each other with some, some assignments where the lecturers give us are a little tedious and hard. So we try to assist our fellow brothers with those. And we also host sessions such as the orientation session where we build the character of men of might, where we always encourage, oh, it's there. So we can see, as you can see on the screen, um, it's just a photo of them playing some, I think it's dominoes, wait, let me look. Oh, it's cards, right. And I see the domino pack on the table. But um, yes, so, we just try to do our best to help each other and to just be ourselves while being men of Michael. And that is, in a sense, the essence of my presentation. But let me go further. So at the Glen Owen Hall, we have a few committees where um, the beautification committee, they constantly work to improve the aesthetics of the hall. So here on the screen, we are seeing a photo of the GOH that was carved out and we planted a few um, plants, a few flowers in the carvings just to enhance the beauty of the hall. We also cleaned up the shrubbery around the flower garden. We removed the, the weeds and the different things that would, were affecting the plants there just to make it a bit more pleasing to the eye. We had some major projects done by the institution, thank you, um, where the Glen Owen kitchen was refurbished and the lounge, oh, I spelled lounge wrong, was, <laughs> was given a 42-inch smart TV where the men can lounge and sit, watch TV and just enjoy themselves, take a load off, you know? Yes. <laughs> We also had seven new clotheslines installed on the ground floor. And we are really grateful for that. Very grateful. <laughs> yes. Uh, we also, from the committees, they built a vegetable garden. Now they planted callaloo, peppers, tomatoes, and other things. Just to keep, you know, sometimes they're a bit hungry and we want a little sustenance, the Lord has provided the garden, you see? <laughs> right. So we also have a few works in progress where we are trying to get a new water cooler installed. We have, we have reached out and we are getting the things done so that we can get the water cooler because it's a bit hard to walk from Glen Owen to the middle of the school to get some water, you know? So we're, we're working on that. We're also working on an additional fridge because we noticed that the fridge space, if the population keeps going up, we're going to be in trouble. Trust me. We also are working on the progress, the, the, the grass. So we realize the grass has been getting a bit brown and we want to get that back up to the standard that we know that the Glen Owen is about. 
And we recently, through the Guild of Students, as I am the vice president, we, <laughs> we opened a shop down there just to keep the men happy because sometimes they want a little cheese tricks or a little bun at night. You know, it's just, you want a little food sometimes and you don't know where to get it. We have it down there. We plan to plant fruit, fruit trees. We plan to gather some funds for a new washing machine. We also plan to host a cookout, which all of you are invited to. Just bring a little pot with some food and we accommodate you. And I said the water cooler before, but it's, it's of importance. I will say it again. We need a water cooler. Um, so in a sense, at the end of my presentation, thank you for listening. Um, big up Glen Owen every time. Thank you. All right, so you hear what's happening on the Glen Owen Hall. Thank you again, Mr. Shaw. We hope, we wish you all the best with getting that water cooler. And let us know when the cookout will be. I'm sure that there are many persons here who would like to join you on the cookout. Before we go any further, I'd like to call not Las Voces Melodiosas, but I'd like to call the micro choir forward as they will be gracing us with a presentation, Deo da Camios Gracias.
and we give God thanks. We give God thanks for what is, what has been, and what will be. Thank you again to the Michael Choir. I now call upon Miss Audrey Williams to do the presentation or the introduction of our presenter. She is the ver first VP of MOSA. Top of the afternoon, everyone. Let me acknowledge the chairman, Dr. K. Dunkley. Let me acknowledge the presidents of the Michael College and vice presidents, board of governors, members, executive of MOSA. And let me acknowledge my president, Dr. Glenda Prescott, who has been doing this tremendous job. I also want to single out some persons from abroad, Mr. Thomas of Muska, sorry, of Muska, and to Dr. Morrison who on her own volitions, volition, sorry, has been attending all the functions and helping to organize, and it takes a lot. It's not a vote of thanks. So our lecturer today is a graduate three times from the Mona University. What a man of little ambition. <laughs> from the Mona University. He did his bachelor's, his master's, and his doctoral studies from the University of the West Indies. But what empowers him to be our speaker today? He has been all over in education. In 1988 and 91, he was at the Sam Sharp Teachers College. Lecturer but not only lecturer, resident coordinator as well. Then he went on to the Woolmers Trust High School for Girls, all Woolmerians in the house. He was counselor to the parents. Can you imagine? He's not an ordinary man. He was history teacher, and that you have to be bright to teach. First year to sixth form. But he could not resist coming to the Michael to teach. He had to get himself a little Michael, whether by not a student, then he said, I'll be adjunct. <laughs> Presently, he's also adjunct at the Vocational Training Institute. He recently joined the staff at the Ministry of Education and Youth as Assistant Chief Education Officer slash Director in the Policy, Analysis, Research, and Statistic Unit. All the bright things. Prior to this, he worked as a senior staff member in the Inspectorate. So he's covering all spares. Before that, he spent nearly 25 years at the Planning Institute of Jamaica, advising and reporting to the government of Jamaica on the education training and the labor market. He has served as past technical secretary for both education and training, playing an instrumental role in the development of the government of Jamaica's vision 2030. So if we're not getting there fast enough, we know just who to check. <laughs> he recently completed his PhD research and today we have a very cantankerous topic. Issues and challenges facing educational institutions in Jamaica. The way forward, that's a big thing the way forward in these troubled times. But don't lose hope, listen to this. His investigation, his thesis, is constructing a model for creating high quality secondary schools in Jamaica using grounded theory methodology. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm just the order of let me introduce you to the main course, Dr. Stephen Carr.
Let me start by acknowledging the presence of Dr. K. Dunkley, which I met when I was an adjunct staff at VTDI. Um, Reverend Boswell Mullings for a good prayer. I want to acknowledge Rudolph Sewell, the acting president of Michael University College, who I met way back in 1997. I want to tell you that story. I saw a job in the newspaper for an adjunct staff here at Michael. Applied and totally forgot that I applied. I got a call on a Monday to say, you're starting this afternoon? No interview, they don't even know if I'm a serial killer. Nothing. <laughs> Come, and I started working the same evening. Never interviewed. Just solely based on my resume, Miss Edith Allen hired me on the spot by a phone call. Come to work this afternoon. And so I've been here. I was here at, um, at Michael for nearly 15 years. 15 years, and I think I did a very good job during that 15 years. And I have a number of persons who can attest to that. Mr. Duaney, Mr. Holt, can say whether I did a good job while I was here. I want to say also that um, I want to acknowledge also the, the president of the Michael, of Mosa, Dr. Glenn, Glenda Prescott, um, the acting VP, Mr. Alvin Lawson, Ghoul, Mr. Shaw, with all the plans for food <laughs> at the Glen Owen Hall and Miss Audrey Williams who I met some time ago she would even know I met her I was on the board of Sam Shaw Teachers College and Audrey came as a an applicant for the job of principal for Sam Shaw Teachers College and who also was on that panel your current president so it was, a, it was a toss up between Miss Williams and your current president. And you know what happened? The history <laughs> speaks for itself. But I'm here because I think I have a passion, a passion for education. I, I can remember I was in a library at Trelawney, Falmouth Parish Library, just looking around the newspaper and saw an application for a for, for Sam Shaw Teachers College to be a teacher. And, I, and I, I couldn't apply because I wasn't yet 17. But you know in Jamaica, who know, who know, who know, who? My mother got me into Sam Shaw Teachers College. Got me. So I got into Sam Shaw very early. And I am telling you, I think that experience makes the better of me. We got up, we raised chicken, we cooking the... In, in, in the canteen, but I can tell you right now, I'm a better person for that experience, living on campus. And I live actually half an hour down the road. I never went back home. Never. I lived on the campus. When they said anything for summer, they want a security guard for summer, my hand gone up. <laughs> so I never went back home. But the experience, I'm loving it. And I had a principal then that, trust me, Simon Clark, the man said, the man, he basically said to us, don't try. Just do it. That was his exact word. Just do it. And I want to put that to you that this PhD I did is the most difficult thing I've ever done. Five years, three hours sleep. And all I can remember is this man in the back of my head, just do it. And so I'm glad I'm here to make this presentation. And I'm glad I'm here because based on the names I heard before, I think I'm in a good spot. I, I, you, Rex Nettleford. <laughs> I'm honored to be here, very honored. And so, as a researcher, I went and found out who is this man called Glenn Owen. So I went and searched and called people all over Jamaica, and I found a, a man who knew him very well, knew him very well. And he said to me, this man is a Polish gentleman, a Polish. I never heard the word before, so I didn't understand. How could you describe a man as being a Polish gentleman? And then I got the message when I called somebody else, and they gave me the same reason. This man is a Polish gentleman. His command of the English language is perfect. So perfect that they felt that he could be the next governor general of Jamaica. Very good, very good speech. And Clifford, Clifford Campbell, 
was our first governor general, they had a feeling that after Clifford went, he would be the next governor general of Jamaica. But my understanding, Dorrit, is that he was from the wrong political persuasion. But that's, that's, that's just then. And so, I'm honored to be here to speak about this man. One of the jokes I got about this man is that he was at Gunboat Beach in the water in him shorts, but dressed in his jacket. That's how perfect this man was. Always immaculately dressed. And I, and, and I want to emulate him, so I decided to dress properly for this presentation today. But let me tell you what I'm here to talk about. I'm exploring issues in education. That's what I'm here to do. Explore issues in your education. And so one of the first things I want to talk about is an understanding about what is quality education. There are people offering education in Jamaica. You know? Well, what is quality education? What is it? You have to have an eye for quality to know what quality is. You can be offering something that looks cheap. It looks, people come. But what is it you're offering? So my opinion is that Quality education is a fundamental right, crucial to the development of the individual and society. It involves providing everyone with the necessary opportunities, skills, and knowledge to thrive in that environment. And here are some key aspects. Inclusive, it must involve everybody. Everybody. And I don't know how many are aware that there are more kids being born with ADHD and, and, and um, what's it? autism recently. I, I'm, I'm amazed. I probably never heard about these, these situations when I was going to school. Maybe one or two kids. But autism is almost one, almost every classroom. Yeah. One of the work, one of the jobs I did in the past was a, a school teacher, a, a school inspector. And I went into a school up in the hills of maybe St. Thomas. But there were at least five kids with autism in that class. And how I know that they were autistic? In the middle of the day, these kids were ringing the school bell. The school bell is for everybody in the, every, every classroom. You know. They were ringing the school bell at regular, op, at regular op, uh, opportunities. And the teacher was busy trying to put them in their seats. And I'm wondering, why is it that we have so many of these? But I think that we need to look at, one of the things that I'm looking at at the ministry is a special ed policy. And that special ed policy is going to put more shadows into our schools. And so some of these kids, in that particular class, you need about five shadows. But you're going to need more special educators in our system. And the other thing is equitable access. Equitable. So everybody must have a chance to get to where they want to go to. And I'm going to tell you about some work I've been doing at the Ministry of Education to create equitable access in Jamaica. And the work that you must be doing must be relevant and effective learning outcomes. It should be, it should allow you to prepare yourself for future challenges. All right? So that's what I want to talk about today. I am mind this, 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 this person, Professor Neville Ying. I would call a mentor. A mentor for me in terms of my PhD work, but he put me in, he, his, his mindset is 22nd century. He's way ahead of his time. And one of the things he told me is that the preparation of students for the next industrial age, I don't know how many are aware that the next industrial age is going to be pure computers. You're doing CXC, everybody doing CXC by computers. And so the whole computer world is going to take over. You're just starting AI and all of these things. But it requires students, not only with academic skills, but also students who are critical thinkers. Can't go away without that. Innovators, problem solvers and who possess the requisite soft skills. I want to tell you this joke, but don't tell me that I'm not, I'm not, I'm, I'm, I'm lying. Somebody calls the Ministry of Education recently. They call, and ask, I don't know who they ask for. Well, before they could answer, or ask who they want to, the person on the line said, this is Bellevue Hospital, can I help you? Those soft skills is what we're talking about. I think, they might have think it's a joke, but they got fired because of that customer service trick. Soft skills is gonna be important going forward. And so, what I'm doing today is out of some work. We had a 2004 education transformation program, and we have a 2020 transformation program. Because of the work I was doing with my PhD, they felt it important that I be a part of this commission. And so my role in the commission was looking at 
things like curriculum, um, teacher training. And one of my pet projects, and a project I'm telling you I wanted to go far further, is having service clubs in school, not service clubs, let's call it community, community service. That every single student in the school gets an opportunity to do 15, 20, 30 hours of community service starting from grade 7. And I think that this particular opportunity provides students with the opportunity to understand volunteerism, to understand service, to understand excellence. And I think that is one of the things, if, if nothing happens out of this transformation, that's one thing I want to go further. Every single student gets an opportunity to volunteer and to, and to, and, and to help the community that they live in. All right? So we are looking at trend. And out of trend, out of this Patterson report, all under Patterson report, came seven areas that we ought to be looking at. He made 365 recommendations coming out of that report. One for every day of this week, of this year. 365 recommendations. Currently, they're trying to, in year one, solve about 101 of those recommendations. But it's in different areas. It's in governance and accountability. It's in early childhood education. I spent the greater part of today with the Early Childhood Commission trying to help them to develop a policy in Jamaica that will help the early childhood sector. Teaching curriculum and teacher training, tertiary sector. You don't hear anything about tertiary. That's what I'm doing here at the ministry. I'm trying to develop a higher education policy for Jamaica. TVET, infrastructure and technology. That's where we're spending most of the money right now. And the last one, finance. And finance, I think, is going to be our hardest task. And I'll tell you more during this presentation. So by 2030, this transformation program will improve literacy to 90% for literacy and 80% for, for numeracy. That's in eight years' time. How many of you in this room think that that is possible? We're moving literacy to 90% and numeracy to 80%. Powers that be feels it can be done. A lot of work, a lot of coaching, and so forth. There's also the effective transition of students at each level. So the, the national standards curriculum is going to ensure that everybody who moves from each level of the system is prepared, is ready for the next level. That's what we want to see in eight years' time. So readiness for higher learning, readiness for the world of work. If you're going to be ready for the world of work, you must have at least five or more subjects to get somewhere. And that's going to be very important in ensuring that more of our students get five subjects or more. Leadership. One of, my, one of my conclusions from my research is that a poor leader leads to a poor school. A good leader leads to a good school. And if you can improve leadership, you can improve the quality of the school. That's given. That's given. Um, so the leadership rating by NEI, so NEI rates a school, and the NEI will tell you that the leadership scores, scores are one or two, poor. Chances are, you check everything else, that school is not going to get a good grade, based solely on the, the, the performance of the leader. Teacher competency, and one of the things that I thought was important is teacher quality and quality of teaching. So if you can get that right, chances are we improve the system. Um, a holistic education, 80% of our students have a positive social rating and can contribute. That's where I talk about the service club. We're going to be looking at that eight years down the line. Completion rate, how many of your students complete seven years of high school? We're working on that. Some years ago, it could be at least 30%. What we want to look at is how we complete that task. So what are the issues? The issues I'm thinking, and I can tell you clearly, is about quality. And I saw that during COVID. There's a clear disparity between urban schools and rural schools. There are some schools that never saw schooling during COVID. Never. Nobody came to school. One, two, three students. Nothing happening. Those are things we're going to have to look at in terms of quality education. And we're going to have to look at how we measure measure performance, measure, measure outcomes. It can't be academic performance alone. And there are some kids who are doing very well on the TVET track. 
And there are kids who, with the right mentoring, could do very well in our schools. And so you look at their aptitude, you look at their attitude, we could get some more. And there are people like myself who never started early. So I left high school, in my, and in the, in the opinion of my parents, a failure. Today I'm a doctor. Understand that. So there's workforce preparation. Whether this, 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 this system, school system we have is equipping students for the workforce, the skills, the competences required, um, looking at entrepreneurship. We don't have to get into a job. We can create a job. And the whole idea of Vision 2030, what is the role of education in um, promoting sustainable development and sustainable lifestyle, aligning what we're doing to Vision 2030. What, where we want to be. We want to be a first world country by 2030. We have a lot of things to accomplish. So other issues, other issues that I, that I thought was important is the ability of teachers' colleges to attract the best students. If you know anything about the Finnish government, all their teachers are quality teachers. They go into a, into a university and say, let me see the top 5% of the students in your university. They take out the top 5%. They train them to be a teacher, and they pay them the third highest salary in the country. Understand where I'm going? If we're going to improve the quality of teachers, then we ought to be attracting a better pool of, of students. And how we do that? I can tell you, it might require funding. It might require making teaching. I don't want to use the word sexy. But making teaching attractive. <laughs> Once you get there, people will come. All right? So that's one issue. The idea of the relevance of courses, how these courses are relevant to what's out there in the world of work. What are the jobs turning up? There are people now working in BPOs, trained, masters, working at a, at a, at a, at a BPO, taking phone calls and resolving issues. How relevant are the skills that we have? And we are getting to the needs of society. Then we look at the staff, the staff, the faculty of many of these teachers' colleges. Are they professionally aligned? Are they, are they aligned to some professional um, association? Are they IT savvy? I remember going to a school in Portland and was recommending to the principal that these teachers need to know how to, to do things like, um, like apps, getting students into these assessment apps. One of them I can't remember right now. But these assessment apps, students came alive because they were actually seeing themselves performing. At the same time, they could say how oh, well they were performing against all the students. Huh? Kahoot. Quizzes. Quizzes is what I was trying to remember. So quizzes, Kahoot. All of these programs were bringing the classroom I saw alive because students were engaged and they were being assessed right at the same time as they were learning. And the classroom came alive. And I said to the principal, you need to expand this opportunity to all your teachers. And the principal said to me, very frankly, I got them to open the computers. I got them to go to Google Suite. Where do you think I'm going to find them to get to this app and learning all of these? It's a new dimension. That will never happen. You know, they said, the ad on TV, that will never happen. <laughs> That's what the principal tell me. So. We want to look at that. We want to look at infrastructure. The, the, the labs you have here at, at, um, at MICO are they state-of-the-art labs. And so there is a project out of the GOJ called a tertiary inf infrastructure project to improve all the labs in all the teachers' colleges. And that is on the way. And that's, so those are some solutions. The knowledge and use of AI. Let me give you a joke. And don't say it's a joke because it is a joke. My, my son goes to Arden High, and the school recently found that an entire class was using AI to sit an exam. So as soon as the question came in, they plug into AI, got the answers, and write the answers down, and they were beating the system. But they thought they were beating the system because Arden has everything wired, so they know which sites you go on. And so they were able to come into the classroom and say, you, 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 you. Come with me. But the idea is that people are using AI and they can use it for good reasons and for bad reasons. We need to find a way, a solution. There's flexible modalities. You don't have to come to school every day. Recently, there was an issue in Jamaica and people, I think it was a, a bombing in school, different things happening in school and opportunities for flexible modality. 
And another issue that we come to uh, alert to Jamaica is limited funding. There's never enough funding. Yeah, there's never enough funding, inadequate infrastructure, shortage of teaching material, shortage of technology. That's a given in many institutions and how we resolve that. The way forward is advocating for increased government funding and investment in education, seeking partnership with private sector for resource support and exploring innovative solutions for digital learning platform to mitigate resource constraints. Teacher shortage. Let me just say to you that teachers have always left Jamaica. Ever since I know myself, teachers have left. Teachers have left for different reasons. So why them left and come back? Where them go, where they went to, not even Tivoli surprised. So, 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 so they've been, they go to a school that students are basically cussing them out. And so those who felt that America was a bed of roses found that, <laughs> found that housing, accommodation, accommodation could go at least $1,000. It is $2,000 for your salary, and accommodation is $1,000. So some of them got a wake-up call very early and came back home. But we have always had teachers leaving, and so we need to look at how we how we solve the problem. And one of the ways of solving the problem is to look at, and this is, this is something that I'm, that's a part of my PhD research, how we get to UA and tell some students that in order to get rid of your student loan, we're gonna, we're gonna wipe away your student loan on the premise that you come into a school downtown and work for a year. After working a year, and we're gonna train you to be a teacher. So these are bright students at UA. We're sending them into a community where taking rid, rid of all their, their student loan and any other bills that they have, and we're allowing them. It's called Teach for Jamaica Initiative. And there's a Teach USA Initiative, but that's something that we're looking at. We mentioned the curriculum and whether the curriculum creates critical thinking, problem solving, digital literacy. You can't go nowhere, as the farm workers found when they went to the US. Even the machines that they are working with needs to be programmed. You're not, you're not digitally literate, chances are, chances are you won't get a job in the future. So we're looking at how we change curriculum development processes and to provide experiential learning opportunities for many. Adapting to technological advancement, this is one of the things. I've been to a school out in Olaba, I think it was Olaba High, and I was impressed with CAD and CAM methodology that they had. No other company in Jamaica have that. I can tell you that. So we're training these youngsters on a technology that don't exist in any company here in Jamaica. How we change that, how we align that is going to be important. Same at Jose Marti. State-of-the-art technology, digital tools, but we didn't get that. So one of the things that I found in my research is that the demand for higher education has doubled in the last 20 years. However, only a third of the countries in the world are enrolling more than 50% of the traditional age cohort. We are enrolling about 35%, 35%. We want to get to 50%. There are a number of things we have to do to bring this number up. And so one of the things that I'm working at at the, at the ministry is a higher education policy. And what the higher education policy is based on all the issues we're having, all the challenges we're having between institutions offering the same subject. So you're doing business administration, you're doing law, you're doing medicine when there are institutions already doing that. And we want to look at how we align all of that. So there's a robust governance structure that we want to look at. Another issue that we have is low access to tertiary education, rarely based on the issue of affordability and the issue of matriculation. And so we want to change all of that. We want to have students integrating work to to what they're doing. I went to England some time ago and saw some students at a university. They were at a university, they were not 20, they were 18 years of age, and they were decked out. They looked smart, smart as ever. What they were doing by day is working, is learning about cars at this university. And when they left school, they went to a, a BMW. They went to a company and practiced what they did. After a period of a year or two, these were people who were, were certified for uh, occupational certification. 
So this, this is an apprenticeship program that were put in youngsters, and you couldn't tell these youngsters that they weren't going to university. So they got to university. They were in a program at a university, but they were learning skills, workplace-ready skills. We want to look at something like that for Jamaica. Um, another issue that we have in Jamaica, there are a number of people who would have, all their life, their mother sent them to go learn a trade. And you can't tell them they're not mechanics. So they worked as a mechanic. They worked in a, in a, in a, in a, in a, in a, in a legal establishment for years, but have no certification to show. We think that there's a large pool of people out there who know how, to, you're waiting about midnight, they can make something for you with their eyes closed, but they have no certification to prove that. And we think we could garner that group of people, a large group of people that got certified, not certified, that got the skills, but no certification. It's called PLAR. We want to find those people and certify them. That's part of what we're going to. Um, there's issue of STEAM and STEM. And there are people who say that it's not STEAM and STEM or STEM and STEAM, it's STREAM. Those who know what stream is, tell me what is the R. Reading. I heard that, but it's not reading. Well, reading is possible. What's the other one? I heard religion, too. I've heard religion. And it's about resources, about resource mobilization and so forth. All right, so we want to fix that. Um, character education has become a part of what I'm doing. All of a sudden, it's important that the students build the right character. How many are aware of a system called SWPBIS? SWIBIS. So SWIBIS is in our school, and it's creating all kinds of waves in terms of students developing the right attitude and the right character. We want to build that out in every school, in every school in Jamaica. So we come to a conclusion. We come to a, to a question. Is tertiary education a public good or a private good? Most research will tell you it's a private good. People who, um, who are in poverty get a tertiary education and are no longer in poverty. They get a good salary and so forth. So people talk about private good. They have the opinion that because of a tertiary education, they're no better off than they were before. We think that it's more of a social good. The more people, try and think if everybody in Jamaica had a degree. What it would mean in terms of society, in terms of values, in terms of attitude, I think it might change. Some people might say we might have more white collar crime. But I think that the, 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 the society, the values in society would change if everybody was educated to a particular standard. And that's a first degree. So we think it's more of a public good than a private good. And so government must spend some money to make it a reality. And so these are some of the thoughts we have. We want to rebalance the budget across higher education system. There are some schools that rich, 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 rich. And there are some schools like a little school down in Trenchtown that have no support, no, no whole, no past student association. How we support those schools, smaller schools, and the bigger schools. So that somebody who's doing a, let me give you, a health, a health degree, health aid degree, at a community college would pay lots more than somebody who's at a, a, technical, a technical college like um, Trenchdown. So we want to look at how we balance that. We want to look at how we balance the budget with imperatives. What are the national imperatives? What is it that government of Jamaica feel is important to put the country on a development path? What are the sectors? We want to support those sectors. So if the sector is in agriculture, applied agriculture, we want to give every student who wants to do applied agriculture a chance, a chance by saying, you're a student loan, you're a guarantee. You don't need a guarantor, as you saw, as you saw earlier. How we make the, the, the opportunity equitable. Where am I? We want to give more autonomy to tertiary institutions. So Michael, in being autonom autonomous, would be able to do things with money that never, you couldn't do before. Borrow money, right. So, so you could now invest money, you could now um, create new faculties, create new partnerships, and so that's one of the things that we want to look at. So learner equity, access, we want to give more students from the lower SES a chance to get to tertiary. That's the most important thing. I, if you ever hear me say anything for the rest of the day, that's the most important thing I want to accomplish. More students of the lower SES getting a chance to get to tertiary and to succeed at tertiary. 
and to own their learning. Um, we want to make sure that government funds are used to, 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 to the optimum. One of the thoughts that we have is a Child Opportunity Trust Fund. Here is it as a parent, before even thinking of making love, decide to put some money in a trust fund that your child, when he gets to 18, is a pool of funds ready to send you to tertiary. And that fund is matched with government fund. So whatever you put in government is going to match it. We're thinking it's called a Child Opportunity Trust Fund open to everybody. In case you didn't have a child, we're going to give you back your money. But the idea is that you put money into a fund that could be utilized later on to get you to college. Right now, huh? The parent and the government. We want to use more technology, more blended, more online learning that anybody anywhere in Jamaica, once you have the technology and the Wi-Fi, you can log on to a program at MICO. That is important going forward. The other thing about MICO is that I don't know, when I went to college, you had to go to Samsha. Or you're in Michael, you have to come to town to go to Michael. We're thinking of a program where Michael is everywhere. So there's satellites all over Jamaica. You don't have to come to Kingston. You can run a Michael program anywhere. We are also thinking about training for export. So teachers, there's places around the world that need teachers. If you go to Dubai or UAE, you'll be surprised the number of Jamaican teachers there. And we're looking at an opportunity to train some teachers and to export them with the intent that the government would recoup some of the remittances from this particular venture. But training for export is, could be one of the things that we're looking at. We want to look at career development programs. And, and so if you're going to come to MICO, you need to know that Anywhere you go in the world, people have special needs. Anywhere you go in the world, people can read. And so you're looking at what are the, what are the opportunities. And so your career development program is going to guide people in the right areas because that's where the jobs are going to be. So some career development program that tell you anywhere you go in the world, people get sick. You might want to go into something in health because there is a demand anywhere you go in the world. If you understand that, career development is going to be important. And so this is a model that I, I don't even want to go into it right now, but these are the things that I thought was important. Leadership, pedagogic excellence, how you teach, who are your teachers? Your teachers must be of the brightest mind. You want to reframe the culture and the ethos of the school. I went to a high school in Montego Bay. The motto of the school is disque art discade. Learn or leave. Understand that. You come to learn. You're not coming to learn, you leave. How we create that ethos that people understand that we come to school to learn? Mr. Howell, you know what I'm talking about. Right. How you, can, how you ensure that people come to school knowing what school is about? All right? Well, it creates an enabling environment. So you want to ensure that there's enough funds to run this school. And the way to run the funds is to find out where is the most uh, old, old um, alumni, wherever they are in the world, and get them to help you to build the school. Stakeholder support. And the stakeholder support might be, I don't know if you know about cheer. So there's a cheer here at Michael for entrepreneurial development. And somebody's paying for that. Paying the teachers, paying everything in that cheer. How you look at that. We also thought that parent support is important. Even though you're at tertiary, Parents is an important ingredient in ensuring. I want to give you a joke, but don't say it's a joke. I got you to go to UA. I thought I was a big thing. I'm the first person to go to UA. My mother asked me very nicely, how are you going to get there? Who's going to pay for this? That's the question she asked. But I knew I had to go. And so I found, then back then I was a good athlete. I went to my coach and said, I need to go to university. And he ensured that I got a, a student loan. So I got to UA. And it means I got to UA. That money never spent. That money that I got from student loan never spent. The same lady that said, who was senior? is the same lady that paid every single week, send me money to get to UA. Parent is important in this dimension. All right? 
Accountability. There's something that's lacking in many of our schools. Accountability. There are some schools that don't even do, they don't even care about the ministry because the ministry don't come down here. So, how you create, how you infuse an accountability matrix is going to be important. And finally, anything you're doing has to be driven by data. Anything. You can't, do, you can't change a school without data. You need to know who your students are. You need to know which students are likely to drop out of Michael and reach them before they drop out of Michael. Data, data, data. Very important. And so these are some of the things that I am recommending, but I have spoken to them about before. We think that there should be a kind of a set of leaders, like Mr. Howell. Um, that Mr. Sewell, that, that knows how to lead, that are transformational leaders, that we could say to Michael, let me leave your vice president, vice president in charge for the next three years. And we're sending you, Mr. Sewell, to another school to build that school. We're talking about a set of people who I call, let's call them master leaders, that they are so good at transformation. There's a lady by the name of Bolt, Margaret Bolt. Yeah. Yeah, there's another lady out of Arden called Esther Tyson. These people know how to lead. You pull them, put them somewhere else, and ensure that that school, who has never performed, is now performing because you now have a master leader at the school. That's one of my recommendations. I told you about the Teach Jamaica program. You incentivize teachers. You get to UE. You get to Michael. You say, look, you're your school bill, your, your student loan is 50 million. I can take that away from you. I need to send you down to Trenchtown to work. Um, where are we? Student, 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 student. And this is just my pet peeve. That the way you treat your students here at Michael will determine your legacy. If you treat them well, they will support you from now to eternity. I remember. <laughs> Treat them well. I remember why I love this college called Sam Sharp so much. They treated me well. They fed me well. Every single week I'm in the kitchen working, but I'm being fed. <laughs> but the point is, I will never forget that. And so I will support any initiative that they want to, to have. Accountability is going to be important. We need to have everybody accountable. And when I say everybody accountable, I'm talking from the learner, the parent the principal, the teachers, everybody is accountable for the outcome. Everybody. I come to school for a reason. I study for a reason. I stayed up all night because I like the teacher. But that's another story. <laughs> and so these are some other areas of consideration for, for, for Michael. Blue ocean strategy, orange economy, green economy, research, development, innovation, and investment. These are some areas I want to go to very quickly that we think we could I remember somebody coming to Jamaica with the sole intent of running a film inside your chapel. So, so this is this chapel that resembles any other chapel back in olden times. They wanted to film a movie. It was about a Canadian, uh, a Jamaican who went to Canada, became a policewoman, and it was a story. But the story, they wanted to rent the entire chapel for this process. I'm seeing how you could, I've been on cruise ship where I go and watch, a, I go to a church in the middle of Mexico, 100 US dollar, go to one church, many churches in Jamaica, but I'm here in Mexico looking at a church for 100 US dollar. How you make history come alive, how you create ecotourism in this particular part of the world, those are some things that I think you could log on to, all right? Tours, tours of the campus. We also look at orange economy, music, art. We heard the choir earlier. How do we broadcast that? How do we sell that? How do we create creative industries here? The principal of Edna Manley is here. Opportunities in the orange economy that you could take elsewhere. I know many of you have seen a concert in Germany. A Jamaican, not really Jamaican, a jam, a jam Jamaican, a German Jamaican called Gentleman. I don't know if you have ever seen a concert with gentlemen, but I cry. There are 50,000 people watching this concert. 50,000 people enjoying this particular singer. Same thing with Protégé. When they go places, thousands of people come. 
how you create that dimension here is another way we could make some money. Just think of a cultural district right here on, at the Mica campaign, com, um, compound. Green economy. Everything here should be run by, by um, solar energy. Everything. The lights, the water, everything you can think of. How you generate income in such a way that your light bill, Mr. Stoyer, your light bill is $2,000, not $2 million. All right. How you do that is one of the parts. Solar energy adaptation. Even using the skill sets of these students to generate income. Research and development. That's the last one I want to talk about. How you create hubs? How you create homework centers? I'm trying to find how you could, at, at Michael, create innovative hubs to make money, to research, to helping, helping, let me see why we have a problem now. Ra -ah. This morning I went to early child commission. They need a consultant. A consultant to help them to write a policy. I could see anybody who's doing early childhood here. Creating a consultant to here at Michael to help the early childhood commission to write the policy. And I don't think it's rapid science. Write the policy. Let me tell you how that valuable that is. We're currently hiring a consultant for 12 days. 12 days. Well, cost of that consultancy is $1 million for 12 days worth of work. That's the kind of work I want. In 12 days, I generate a $1 million. And this is something that I think I love. Think of that. Think of how you can make opportunities um, through this research project. The social stock exchange, you might not know much about this, but there's a social stock exchange in Jamaica where you could actually put Michael on the social stock exchange. And people, people pour money into Michael with the intent that if Michael makes money, they also make money. So how you look at that as an opportunity, a, a platform that you could generate funds using this social stock exchange. And so my last parting words is how you as an as a, as a entity Provide support to Jamaica, and you could be you could provide support through mentorship. I was a part of a mentorship program at UAE for years, and this one year, they gave me a male. One single year, every single year before that, a female, and I was happy. But that one male, on the graduation of the mentorship program, cried. He cried because I was the only person, male person, in his entire life that wanted to know how he really did. He didn't have a father. And he suggested to me that why he prospered during that year is because of my constant calls and my constant, I, I brought him home. I fed him. Out of that relationship in this mentorship program, I've changed one individual. How can you as an entity create these mentorship programs so that we can help them? Service club membership. That, that most of the jobs that people get is not through their qualification. It's who they know. Who they know? And that, that the service club is an opportunity to say, yes, I know that man. Yes, I can find you a job. Those are important things. Volunteer. Volunteer is important because everybody wants to. What experience do you have? And I can tell you I worked. I didn't tell them I, I, I work for free, but I worked at this particular entity for over six months. Volunteer is, volunteerism is going to be important. The last one, lifelong learning. You don't think that this micro is the end of it. Continue on. At my age, I have a PhD. I can't even believe that. But continue on. Ensure that you move to the next stage. Ensure any short course that you see being offered. Let me tell you a short course I did some years ago. That's going to be important to me later on. Project management. They are hiring people millions of dollars to do project management. You know a guy who came here to Jamaica for four months and he earned seven million dollars. Project management. Log on to these courses because they're going to help you in the long run. Make more money than you earn seven during the seven days of the week or five days of the week. So that's one area. There are people who want to lose weight like myself. So there are fitness. People going into all fitness program and so forth. There is a school in Canada that invites people 60 years or over to come to a course at midnight. Course starts at midnight. Elderly people. What are they learning? Belly dancing. <laughs> Why belly dancing? Because belly dancing is a new fad in losing weight. 
And there are people who are going to these community colleges, learning something new so that can make some money from the activity. The other one I want to leave with you is hybrid. I have a hybrid car. If the rain starts, the, the, the wiper start move. If light comes down, the light comes on. Everything, I don't think nobody in Jamaica knows how to service these cars. That's an area that I think we ought to be looking at in how we move on. Sol solving the issues of hybrid cars. That is the end of my presentation. I thank you for listening. Mm -hmm. Oh, oh yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, we have heard a lot. We have heard that volunteerism is necessary, and I know we have a volunteer program here at the MICO, and many persons try to sh short their way out of it. Volunteerism is the way to go. Training teachers for export. Leading persons to the labor market. Understanding the labor market needs. Reframing leadership and culture. More online learning opportunities. Michael everywhere. More autonomy at the higher at the higher level. Investing, borrowing, dot dot dot. Questions and answers. This session I am going to ask that persons who have questions. I have there's a mic, there's a roving mic somewhere. We'll just ask. We're on. So I'm gonna start. Anybody with questions? Questions? Yes? Questions? Yes? All right, we have one question. Can you use your teacher voice? Oh, okay. No. You definitely have to come down. All right. Yes? We have it's streaming, so we have to go back. We have to. We have one question. Anybody else having another question coming up? All right. Pleasant afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon, I'm sir. Christopher Scott, a proud student of the Michael University College. Yes. Woo. And Dr. Stephen, I heard where you said there will be a trust fund for parents who are looking to help their child to go to tertiary education. This morning, there was an epiphany where I considered why is it we have soldiers who are being paid to train at the same time after training they are also still paid to serve Jamaica. We have teachers who are the foundation of all the businesses in Jamaica. But yet still coming to university it is a challenge. I had to step out for two years out of my degree program due to COVID. Mm -hmm. And during that time, it was very hard, both on myself and my family. I faced some traumas that has taught me how to maneuver situations that will come to me in the future. Why is it we aren't compensated at this time during our endeavors to accomplish our educational dreams and aspirations. As teachers. Uh, good question, sir. Let me say clearly, let me say something about, about, about myself. I, I, I went to university at a time when it was free, totally free. I paid $90 to go to UA, $90. A committed government understand that tertiary should be free. That's a that's step going forward. So I went, to, I went to, to university and paid $90 for the entire year. If I didn't remove a book from the library or break any glass, I'd get back that $90. So I, huh? caution fees. Yeah, caution fees. Thank you, sir. I never spent a cent to go to UA. In my other year, I, 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 I assessed was put on, on students. And what I did, I went to the US for the summer. Went to the US and went to work in a Coca-Cola factory. I worked the entire summer 
in a Coca-Cola factory. In this Coca-Cola factory, everything is free. So if you check me at any time, my wee-wee looks like Pepsi. <laughs> but the point I want to make is that when I came back home from Jamaica, came home, came home to Jamaica, I had enough money to last the entire year. Because I worked every single day. You know what they call me while I was at Coca-Cola? They call me OT. You know what OT means? Overtime. overtime. They just want to say, anybody for overtime? My hand is up. And so I worked, I worked, I worked. And I made money to last me the entire year. But I'm not saying part of that. Part of that, we're trying to access. We're trying to get more people from the lower SES into tertiary. So you have a challenge we are looking at, and this is with agreement with the Ministry of Finance, how we reduce your interest rate for a student loan anywhere between 0 and 5%. So based on where you are, whether you're whether your bathroom is outside your house or inside your house, will determine whether you get 0% or 5%. I'll give you an idea. So your, your beneficiary identification system will say you don't need a high loan. You need a low loan to get you to college. Those of you who aren't aware, just two days ago, the Minister of Finance announced that you don't need a guarantor to get a loan. That's a, that was an impediment, impediment to many schools. Many students, how to get to UA, how to get a guarantor. The next day after that particular act was passed by the Minister of Finance, the president of NCU wrote me a letter to say, Dr. Carr, I know you've been clamoring for this for years. This is your dream come true. Because I went to NCU, and that was the issue there at NCU. And within the space of four months, the government of Jamaica announced no more guarantors. Question. I see the hands raising. I see them all going up. I see them all. Where is the, where is the mic? R mic Roval? No mic. Rayon. Mic. No. No. Not no. All right. Yes. Yes, you may. She can. She will. It will. It will come up. Okay. Mm. Mm. Mm -mm. Yeah. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Good evening. I am Monique Mitchell, a guidance counselor in practice. My question is, is there anything being created at the moment to make it mandatory that teachers see counseling? Because I realize that you spoke about the resources and you speak about mastering leadership and so forth. And while we are dealing with some issues and some challenges, I want to know that teachers and self-care is something that Jamaica is thinking about for the future because while we're saying more students should come in and try to be teachers we need them to know that we care for them before we're telling them to care for our students so I would like to know if it is being something to see that so many teachers are getting strokes so many teachers are dying so many teachers are quitting what is in the pipeline for teachers You know my presentation had something on that, but well, I, 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 I ran through it. The, we are of the opinion that to make teaching attractive, to make teaching attractive, we need to ensure that all the needs of teachers are taken care of. And so if we're not able to give you the kind of resources, financial resources, we should have systems in place to ensure that your, your image, your, your, your esteem, all of those things are taken care of. It was in my presentation. Just I, I swept over it. Okay. And once you're a member of the JTA, there is an opportunity for you to get uh, counseling. But the, the counseling, a counselor, I want to say to you that that's one of the areas that we think there's going to be growth. That because of all of these, because of COVID, because of all these mental issues, there are going to be a need or there is going to be a need for trained social worker 
train guidance counselors to get the system back, to get the system back. I'm currently doing some research on maladaptive behavior. I think, and the research have proven that, that since COVID, the level of maladaptive behavior among our students have intensified. So there were kids who never get trouble, all of a sudden start giving trouble. And that whole impulse of students giving more trouble in our schools is creating some issues among us. I went to a school up in Geisel where there were seven little boys, seven grade five boys, shutting down the entire school. Seven boys. That they were thinking of kicking them out. The board meeting about seven little boys shutting the school down. There's a need for a whole cohort of guidance counselors to help the system to regularize. But that's my thought. All right, I see two hands up. I see two hands up the mic to the gentleman in the yellow, to the gentleman in the yellow. Yeah, coming, 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 coming. To the gentleman in the yellow. No, I still need you on the mic. Where is the mic? So he's right here. No? Can I ask you to come down? No, can I ask you to come down? No? Dr. Meredith, can I ask you to come down? <laughs> Can I ask the young gen the gentleman to come down as well? Yes. Can I ask? Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My question to you, Dr. Carr, is this. You had stated that education, tertiary education, should be a public good. But we are seeing that with the STEM scholarship opportunity, we are required to provide three guarantors, right? If it is supposed to be a poor person's opportunity, how is a poor person supposed to provide three guarantors with the requirement of either a land title or a car title or $100,000 in the bank account? How is this? To be honest with you, I didn't know that. What I do know is that many of these scholarships go back. And I can know now why they're going back. All of these scholarships are being offered and nobody taking them up. I now know why. Thank you, sir. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I'll raise that with the powers that be. We have we have three more persons. We have three questions. Dr. Meredith. Thank you. Um, sir, good evening everyone. Thank you. Um, two issues my colleagues have asked me to raise this matter. You did talk about the school-wide positive behavior support uh, program in schools, but then you also just now talked about just a few students who are able to shut down a school. The question is, in light of the sociocultural factors, in light of those things that we put in place that may not necessarily have the sustained attention, what is the ministry doing to ensure that those things that are put in place to address some of the bigger challenges in, the, in, in this society, which are in the school as a microcosm of the society, how is it that the ministry is seeking to address those things to ensure that there's sustainability of those particular interventions? First question. That one is a hard one. Um, what I do know is that out of the research that I did recently on maladaptive behavior, there are some conclusions that we have drawn. Conclusions that in some school, not now go on. And so how we identify those schools and how we support them is part of the pet, one of the pet projects of the current permanent secretary. She wants character education to be out on the horizon. And so right now, I am working on a survey to find out what's happening in schools regarding character education and then to advise the peers as to how do we go from here, led by Dr. Flowers. 
circle, all right? But that's something on the agenda. And um, the research I did showed that we have some serious issues in our schools. Thank you. The second question, of course, you know, I have vested interest in this. So you did mention the policy on special education, which, to my knowledge, has been a policy in draft for over 25 years. Where are we with that getting to Parliament and becoming an act? All right, very tough question again. So my unit at the ministry is responsible for special ed. I can tell you it's 99% complete. So after waiting 20 years, this project or this policy, we received some comments just yesterday from the special ed unit um, as it relates to financing. So financing is going to be one of the pet issues that's delaying this policy any further. Do you have an idea what it would cost the government to really implement a special ed policy, ensuring that there are shadows in every school, ensuring that the assessment, assessment, assessment mechanism are available all across Jamaica, expecting that therapy will be available. I don't know how many of you are aware that this is an area you ought to get into. A therapist, a speech therapist, can cost anywhere between $60,000 for one visit. One visit. And your child will need at least 10, 10 to 15 to 20 visits. That's an area that you need to be looking at. Special needs, all of these people are assessing you. There's a lady by the name of Maureen Sams Vaughan. She assesses. And she has a series of assessments, each of them gradually increase the amount of money that you need to pay to get your child assessed. Just for assessment, we're not talking about treatment. And so understanding this is an area that if I was to go back to school, this is one area I would go back for, us. assessment of people. And special needs, all these people with autism and, and, and ADHD, I want to assess them, a lot of them. So there's money to be made, word to the wise. We have two final questions. We have two questions coming up. Ms. Williams? Um, so, so first, um, look, I know that it's a leadership makes a difference. So I'm wondering what you have in your thing for the parents who lead the children, who lead the children, because some of them belong in front of Vauxhall, and they create quite a lot of havoc. The children have no leadership. Sometimes when they get up to come to school, there's nobody to help them and so on. So we have to put something there to educate those parents. The second thing to the, to the students, um, they need to look more because there are a lot of grants, scholarships, Jamvat. And the micro fees, I'm not sure what it is now, but I know that I have sent students to the ministry, even at a dying moment, and they would have gotten help. The only requirement for the Jamaica Values and Attitudes is that they would give 100 hours in voluntary service. We have done that at the university for the students at the last minute, and they are able to get it. So they need to look, there is scholarship, there's Grant, and there is Jamvat. They just need to go at that Georgian building around the back, um, tertiary unit, and some more of them will get some help. Thank you very much, Ms. Williams. You are reminding us that there are opportunities out there, students. You do not be afraid of seeking them out. And don't wait until the appointed time. Deadlines are not, are not good. All right, our final question goes to Mr. Sewell. Our final question goes to Mr. Sewell. Sorry. Um, good evening, Sir Karen. Thank you so much for putting the issues in perspective as the one playing that position on the field for a while. Um, you glanced over something quickly, you know, the rationalization. Um, when you mentioned one college doing medicine and the other. Uh, just wondering what is the thinking? Is the rationalization in terms of where the government is supporting? Or does rationalization mean we're going to limit institutions? Because from the responses, we're not going to go back, isn't it? There's some private element. So is rationalization saying 
to the extent that the ministry is supporting programs, we're going to rationalize and institutions specialize. Or, the policy, or is it that we're still going to allow institutions to be creative and to develop programs to meet certain market needs to the extent that persons are willing to pay? So for example, Michael, we had a discussion with someone from Eastern Illinois University today, and we are looking at the whole matter of masters in areas of special ed. And so people would be willing to pay for that. You know, you get, you get the thinking? So I am very nervous when we hear rationalization. So I want to hear what is the policy thinking on that. Let me say to you that this is, this is the hardest topic that I will ever discuss. Because there's some college, some, yeah, don't say nothing? Yeah, yeah. All right. Okay, all right, let me start over. Let me start over. Yeah, let me be guided by the principle of um, Edna Mandy. No, I, okay. What I do have an opinion about is that this is one topic that we, we have not resolved. We have not resolved because there are people who need to make money. There are colleges who need to make money. And the government is of the opinion that the funds that we give you is only for developmental programs. So, so if you're doing something in innovation, we'll give it to you. If you're doing something in research, we'll give that to you. If you're doing something in agriculture, we'll give it to you. The idea is that we're encouraging schools to, to I want to say it carefully. Yeah, follow, follow the labor market. Follow what's happening in the labor market. And so the government is not going to sponsor you if you're doing a course at Edna Manley on how to sing well. Because that's not on the agenda. On the agenda is probably something on cultural heritage. We're telling you, if you're doing something that's of natural, national interest, we'll pay for it. And that's what the encouragement. Do things that are of the national interest, and we'll give you money for that. If you want to go do something else, you're going to have to make the people pay for it. All right? And so we're encouraging STEM, we're encouraging STEAM, and we're not streaming it. We're encouraging STEM and we're encouraging STEAM. But bear this in mind. The government has an agenda to only spend on programs that's going to benefit Jamaica. All right? Thank you very much. A round of applause. We put him on the spot. That was a hard one. That was a very hard one. And thank you very much, ma'am. Principal of Edna Manley, who will always keep us on our feet. Thank you ever so much. A round of applause again for our main speaker, Dr. Stephen Carr. I know there are many other persons with questions. I see persons disappointed. Dr. Carr will be around. You may go to him and ask him questions. And so I invite you to take it on afterwards. I am now going to be asking the Michael choir to come forward with their second piece, Ja is my keeper.
Ninja is my health and my strength. So who shall I fear? He is the king upon my right and my left hand. So who shall I is my health and my strength so who shall I fear he is my guide throughout creation so who shall I be afraid Ja is my guide in my resting and my rising. So whom shall I fear? He is my guide when I step out and forward in. So whom shall I be afraid? is my guide from the darkness so who shall I fear he is my guide from the vampires of hell so who yeah, yeah, shall I be afraid Is my life and my strength? So who shall I fear? He is the shield upon my right and my left hand. So who shall I be afraid? Mrs. Berlingram, can I ask you to carry that gift for me?
Okay. Um, I'm truly honored to be um, making this presentation. Um, our chaplain prayed for you to be inspired <laughs> and for us to receive. Thank you for the prayer, sir. <laughs> so we really do appreciate um, all the um, items that you mentioned. I'm sure we have um, our viewers online and in the audience who are very appreciative and they have been asking to make sure that this presentation is online so that they can go back and refer. So thank you so very much. Um, the other, so we are presenting you with this. We searched on the internet for your, okay. We were wondering what your likes and you know, in artistic world was. Yeah. So we were searching. So we hope that we came up with the right thing for you. So on behalf of the Michael University College and the Michael and the Alumni Association, we thank you. Thank you too. Okay. Thank you. All right. Another. Mm -hmm. heartwarming to know how much he has been appreciated. We know that he was wonderful, but we are glad to know that other people think that he was wonderful. And I want to say I very much appreciate what has been done. And I also want to congratulate Michael on the steps they have taken and the strategies they have used over the years. My uncle, as the program says, has been deeply involved in a variety of community-based organizations. But we know that Michael had his heart, and we watch with great pleasure the strides that Michael has made over the years. So the thanks is on, on my side and not on your side. <laughs> OK, so yeah, we agree. Um, the foundation was laid, and we do appreciate, and we thank you. Yes. Okay. We have a special gift, and we ask Dr. Glenda Prescott to come forward to, to make this presentation. Good evening again, everyone. You all know that my heart is with the students here at the Michael. And this evening, at least 118 students were here at this lecture. Give yourself a big hand. We also want to keep the light burning, especially within the houses. We don't want to lose that flame at all. And uh, Mosa is giving a first and a second prize to the houses that were most represented this evening. And the winners are, not my house, <laughs> 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 
first place is Roger's House. They had 38 members. And the second place was um, Arthur Grant. I'll have to work a little harder to get Washington up there. <laughs> so. I'm going to ask um, Mr. Mr. Howell, can you make the presentation for me? Representative here from Arthur Grant. He's coming. The great mighty. Oh, okay. Yes. Yes. Who to present? So, um, please see me right after. Okay. So come. So good. No, Arthur Grant. Um, Arthur Grant. Yes. Yes. Okay. You present it for me. Who can I ask to present it? Um. He's from Africa. Yes, but I need somebody to present to him. Mr. Hall. Mr. Hall. Mr. Hall. Mr. Hall. Mr. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. We are now coming to the close, and we call Mrs. Melrose Foster, chairperson, education committee, who pulled it all together to make today a reality. Madam Chair, um, Dr. K. Dunkley, President Acting, Sir, and the President of the Michael Old Students Association, specially invited guests who have already been acknowledged, the academic, administrative, and ancillary staff of the Michael Students All. I'm delighted this afternoon to speak on behalf of the members of the Mosa community and the Michael University College family to do their acknowledgments on this auspicious occasion. I say auspicious because it is heartening and inspiring to be gathered in this single space spanning both the physical and the virtual with this august body of academicians and technocrats. If I can judge from the demonstration of energy and buoyancy here this afternoon, it is clear that all are pleased with the execution of another educational and enlightening Glen Owen lecture. I wish to convey sincere thanks to the Johnsons family that's for their generosity in being the sole sponsor of this evening's lecture. As you heard earlier, Mr. Rennis Johnson was our second presenter in 1992 in the series of lectures that were done previously. We want to applaud the family and thank them wholeheartedly for their sponsorship. <clears throat> thank you, Dr. K. That's my name, but Dr. K. Dunkley. We want to thank you for taking us through the program of activities so seamlessly this afternoon. You did us well. To Reverend Bosworth Mullings, 
University College Chaplain, sir, heartfelt thanks to you for invoking the presence of God on this our 33rd lecture. You are highly appreciated. For all those who brought greetings this afternoon, I convey with an alacrity our deepest appreciation and assure you that your participation in this lecture has signified the relevance of exploring the theme, issues and challenges facing educational institutions in Jamaica, the way forward in these troubled times. To our keynote speaker, Dr. Stephen Carr, Assistant Chief Education Officer, Director, Policy Analysis, Research and Statistics Unit, your presentation this afternoon was well received. It is evident that the topic was well researched and your presentation was informative and engaging. For this, I register our deepest appreciation and gratitude. Sincere thanks to Mr. Silpot. And I had here, I now understand it is La, La Musicacion. And I thank them for the music, musical items they provided. We thoroughly enjoyed them, and it enhanced this evening's lecture. We appreciate you and commend you for the items that were rendered. It would be remiss of me not to say thanks to the information, communication, and technology team who has ably used the technology to assist with ensuring that production was of the highest quality, and to our own Mr. Hemmings and his team who ensured that the necessary preparations were done to facilitate this lecture. Thanks to Pat's Flower Shop and Lasker Distributors for providing us with gift baskets and everyone who assisted in making this lecture a success. In bringing the curtains down this afternoon, on this another thought-provoking and stimulating occasion, I would like to convey thanks to everyone present in the physical as well as the virtual space and place on record were it not for you this function would not have been a success. I think it has been. Have a good evening, everyone, and thank you. Another round of applause for Mrs. Melrose Foster. The planning for this started a long time ago, and she has stood the course. The today has been good. It has been thought-provoking. It has been stimulating. It has led us to another construct. We are better than we were when we entered the room. Thank you again. Thank you ever so much for being here. We are now going to close with a college song, and I ask you to stand.
Have a pleasant good afternoon.